सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली दिस वीक इज बिगन ऑन व्हाट आई माइट कॉल ए पावरफुल नोट सो बाय दिस टाइम आई एम श्योर ऑल ऑफ अस ऑल ऑफ यू आर एक्सपर्ट्स इन महाराष्ट्र पॉलिटिक्स in the pawar family politics etc etc so let me first look at a set of facts for you and if you look at the set of these facts these tell you something something about our regional politics family politics national politics and ideologies these facts are about the phenomenon of ajit pawar who i might call as the perpetual deputy chief minister of indian politics so look at his record so i this I, i just have this record if you go for example just do a simple thing google him and stop at wikipedia and look at the wikipedia entry under his name and see the highest position that he has reached in his life is 63 now the highest position is reached in his life is deputy chief minister how many times has been he has been deputy chief minister right in the past in the past 13 14 years there the interesting thing you see is how many times you see him deputy chief minister preceded by himself in some cases succeeded also by himself so what is that phenomenon look at the dates now now if you look at the dates 10th november 2010 to 25th september 2012 that is the first time he became deputy chief minister right again not a long tenure just over 2 years or just just a little under 2 years in fact his chief minister then was prithviraj chauhan then once again from october 25 2012 to 26 september 2014 he is again deputy chief minister okay now how come there was a one month gap he was deputy chief minister under the same chief minister prithviraj chauhan and then he again become so so how come there is a months gap and if he were to become deputy cm again why is there a months gap that is because at that point there was a big noise about the irrigation scam and his alleged involvement in it because he was he's traditionally been water resources minister in maharashtra so the big story then a lot of the lot of the activists got involved and of course bjp was involved bjp shiv sena that he was the kingpin in this big irrigation scam which at that point was you know that was a permissive era when you could add zeros to anything maybe 60000 70000 crores or maybe even more that kind of that kind of noise so it was because of that noise that he resigned within a month he was back so i told you the perpetual deputy chief minister then then he has some time in the wilderness because the bjp and shiv sena come into power in maharashtra but november 23rd november 2019 to 26 november 2019 that's a tenure of exactly 3 days of exactly 3 days he became deputy cm again this time under chief minister devendra fadnavis that was the infamous early morning swearing in at 5:30 or 5:35 am that that bhagat singh koshyari as governor carried out that's when devendra fadnavis and bjp thought that they could take ncps mlas away and get enough of a majority to form their government that government didn't last so again he lost he lost his deputy chief ministership that three day tenure as deputy chief minister also was very useful for ajit pawar he achieved a lot within 3 days the anti corruption bureau of maharashtra government gave him a clean chit in the old irrigation scam it was done so quickly that just for the speed it would make not just the limca book of records but even the guinness book of records and more but then you know they cannot be a maharashtra cabinet without ajit pawar as deputy cm so once again who succeeded him as deputy chief minister but ajit pawar himself now now the government of Uddhav Thakre came in. Who is the deputy chief minister? It is Ajit Pawar. And then Uddhav Thakre's government fell, and Eknath Shinde broke away. Shiv Sena broke a large section of Shiv Sena away, and became a part of the BJP government, but became the chief minister. 
He had one deputy chief minister from the BJP, Devendra Fadnavis. But of course, his cabinet wasn't yet complete because it's the Maharashtra cabinet. It needed a specific name as deputy chief minister. So Ajit Pawar is back as the second deputy chief minister. So see how many times has he succeeded himself and how many times he has preceded himself. Five times already. Five times Ajit Pawar has been deputy chief minister in the state of Maharashtra. Twice in the Congress NCP partnership when Congress was the senior partner and NCP the junior partner. Once in the MVA that is the that is the Shiv Sena NCP Congress partnership. I am listing them in that order because that is the number of seats each one got. Shiv Sena NCP and the Congress party. He was deputy chief minister again and now he's broken away. From NCP, in fact, he would like to claim that he's taken NCP with him and the party that he has with him is the real NCP. Just as Eknath Shinde claims that the party that he has taken away with him is the real Shiv Sena. So he's back to being Deputy Chief Minister. Now, for a man at 63, that's a lot of doing. Now, what does it tell you? It, it tells you several things. So on the, on the top of everything, what it tells you about national politics is as follows. Tells you how the BJP has mastered the art and the craft and the science of getting power in states. And to get power in the states, it's willing to compromise with any position. So see in Maharashtra, at this point, the dominant party is the BJP. The, the puppeteer is the BJP. All the rest are puppets on the ground. But while the puppeteer controls the strings, the puppets in the positions are from various parties. So the chief minister is from formerly from Shiv Sena. He claims to be the real Shiv Sena now, but that battle will be on. And we'd like to see what happens when the Brihan Mumbai Municipal Corporation elections and the other urban body elections take place. Then maybe the voters will pronounce on who they think is the real Shiv Sena. But the fact is that BJP has given the chief ministership in a state where it has twice as many MLAs as any other party. This election was not a three-way split. It was a two-way split because the BJP and Shiv Sena fought together and together they had a comfortable majority. But Shiv Sena broke away. They joined hands with NCP and Congress. So that is about 50-something, 50-something, 40-something. If, if we add all of them up, that added up to a majority. So the BJP had as many seats almost as any two of those parties. And yet the BJP has now sacrificed the chief minister's position that's been given away to Eknath Shinde, formerly of the United Shiv Sena. The deputy chief ministership, one the BJP had. So now Devendra Fadnavis, who was earlier, earlier persuaded to swallow the bitter pill by becoming deputy chief minister in a state where he had been chief minister in a government led by his own party, where his party has a much larger majority than the other guy, he was persuaded to accept the deputy chief ministership, a bit of humiliation, but in party interest, he took it. He's now also made to share that position. So even the deputy chief minister's position will not be exclusive. There'll be another one and that the other one will be Ajit Pawar of the NCP, the other party BJP has tried to break up. So what has the BJP done? BJP has made big sacrifices, the chief minister's position, another deputy chief minister's position and so many cabinet portfolios because more and more people from the NCP that has broken away with Ajit Pawar are now being sworn in. So this is the lesson that this episode tells us about national politics, that BJP, once they decide to take power in any state, they are willing to make any price and make any compromises because they know that ultimately the vote, vote has to come to them, particularly the Shiv Sena's vote has to come to them. And if they have the power in the state and if they break, in this case, a case if they break up the MBA, to that extent, it strengthens them in the national elections next year because Maharashtra has been a cause of concern for them. So that's a lesson in national politics. In fact, you can read this lesson along with what happened in Haryana. So if you look at Haryana elections, the BJP was about five short of majority, right? In a small house, house of only 90. Haryana is not such a large state. The Congress party was about 15 short. The Congress party could have gone ahead with Dushan Chotala's JGP, the third largest party, which had about 10, 10 seats. 
and maybe a couple of independents and others and offered them the moon. So maybe Vushan Chautala could have been offered the chief ministership in that case, just to keep the BJP out of power. Did it actually happen? We don't know what transpired behind the scenes. But going by the Congress party's record so far, unlikely that they would have been so open-minded about conceding so much power to a smaller element in a new coalition just to keep the BJP out of power or just to keep their own control over a state. BJP, on the other hand, has no compunction letting the tail wag the dog because they look at the larger political objectives. So they did exactly what they did in Haryana then. They conceded the deputy chief ministership to Dushan Chautala plus a bunch of portfolios. So many portfolios that it looks like he's got more, more portfolios than all the other ministers put together. Now, it's a lot of portfolios and I'm saying this rhetorically, but he's also got a lot of the portfolios which in Haryana's, in the language of Haryanvi politics is, are called Malai portfolios, portfolios that are laden with cream. So the BJP made that compromise in Haryana. Why? Because they wanted a state. They didn't want to lose control of the state. It's next door to Delhi. It's an important state. And similarly, they did not want to lose control over Maharashtra. And once they had lost control, they were willing to pay any price to get that control back. They got that control back by breaking Shiv Sena, but they are not they are not fully satisfied with that. They want to fully secure themselves within this coalition because they also don't want Eknath Shinde getting too appetite and saying, look, I will walk away. I'll go back to Shiv Sena. Give me this. Give me that. So they have, they have also balanced him by getting Ajit Pawar in. And second, in terms of the threat that they were looking at facing next year in parliament elections when a combined MBA, that is Shiv Sena, Uddhav Thakre, Shiv Sena, NCP and the Congress together because in Maharashtra, the anti-BJP vote is also quite strong. If even half of the Shiv Sena vote was combined with the NCP and Congress vote, that would have caused the BJP the loss of many seats in Maharashtra. So they've tried to cover for that also by paying this double big price in the state of Maharashtra, the second biggest state in India. So that is the lesson this teaches us. This episode teaches us on national politics. The third thing that it teaches us is about regional politics. Now look at your regional parties. If we look at our regional parties, our regional parties have a problem. Many of those parties don't have an ideology. So that ideology is either about power or about family or about, or about identity. The best example of a regional party only coming from an idea of identity, say, is the BSP, Bahujan Samaj Party, Mayavati's party. Identity means Dalit identity, and then I've got the Dalit vote, then I'm looking for others. So when I get the Muslims, or when I get some Brahmins with me, or some others, a few others here and there, then I get to about 30%. So UP, in UP, elections used to be split three ways, that is BJP on one side, SP, then BSP in a three-way split, a 30% vote would get you power. So when Mayavati got power in UP with a full majority, Mulayam Singh Yadav got once and Akhilesh got once, each time their vote percentage was just about 30%. That was almost entirely identity politics. Now there again, Akhilesh Yadav and his supporters would get up and say, look, we have an ideology. We are Lohiites. Look at our caps. We wear red caps. All right. You might have some legacy of ideology, but basically, again, that's identity politics. So while in Mayavati's case, it's Dalits as my vote bank and then try and get Muslims. In Akhilesh Yadavs or SP's case, it's Muslims and Yadavs and let's try and get a few others. So these are mostly identity politics parties. Then you see pure regional parties who ride on regionalism. So there is YSRCP in Andhra or there is KCR's party in Telangana. Now KCR is rebranded as party. What was Telangana has now become Bharat. So TRS has become BRS. But you know that this is a party that is driven by the regional aspiration in Telangana. So the, so the fuel driving the party is a regional fuel, fuel of regionalism. See Nabin Patnaik in Odisha. So Nabin Patnaik's party in 1997, Right? In 1997, his father passed away, Biju Patnayak, who was a comrade of the veterans or the founders of the opposition politics in India. 
when his father passed away the bjp was concerned that his politics will also wither away and what will happen to odisha then they didn't want the congress making a comeback in odisha so atal bihari vajpayee and pramod mahajan worked very hard with navin patnaik to persuade him to to basically dress him up to become the successor to biju patnaik he became successor and he's been successor since then now once again in his case his politics is all about regionalism and about himself so when the bjp looks at these parties there are some classical regional parties also for example see the dmk and admk they are parties focused only on one state that's tamil nadu a little bit pondicherry but tamil nadu they inherit an ideology and they fight over the same ideology each one claims to be a more faithful inheritor of the same ideology but the fact is that is also confined to the region but because they have an ideology it's not so easy for bjp to break into their support base but where a party is driven or fueled purely by a regional impulse or family loyalties or caste caste mixes there the bjp sees an opportunity for itself that's precisely what's happened with sharad pawar's ncp because that's a party regional party regional impulse within the region also caste the marathas marathas a very large caste group in maharashtra very large very dominant very powerful within that dominated by one family and it's a four generation political family so while we see sharad pawar his daughter supriya sule who is an mp from baramati the family pocket borough ajit pawar the nephew who is an mla from baramati in fact it's a fact very few people remember now that in 1991 first sharad pawar challenged narsimha rao for the prime ministership this is after the assassination of rajiv gandhi when the job opened up in that election he finally gave up narsimha rao made him defense minister so he needed a lok sabha seat again to contest that's when ajit pawar his nephew who had taken the family pocket borough in the same election of 1991 he had won that election from baramati he resigned to give that place to sharad pawar sharad pawar then contested the resulting by election and won so sharad pawar's mother was an elected local body member in pune party so on that ticket she had got elected then you have sharad pawar then you have his daughter supriya sule and his nephew ajit pawar and his other nephew's son his other nephew's son rohit pawar now is an mla from the ncp so for four generations pawars have been in politics and three generations of pawars have been in the same party but there also when the crunch came sharad pawar preferred the daughter that is supriya sule although ajit pawar is much older and has been in politics for much longer so once again this tells you something about family politics about dynastic politics because something very similar happened in the shiv sena as well raj thakre was very much more like Bala Sahib Thakre spoke very similar language. Uddhav Thakre was much milder, simpler, not so not so spectacular, not so headline making. But the father again preferred the son over the nephew. So in this case again, the father preferred the daughter over the nephew, despite the fact that the nephew was much more experienced. In fact, in his autobiography, which was released just about two months back, I will share with you a story that Purva Chitnis, my colleague from Mumbai, did on that release. in that autobiography itself he refused to name his successor and he said he or she will emerge in time so his saying he or she also made it evident to ajit pawar that supriya sule was very much in line right so he wasn't going to be the natural successor and that did not happen because because when he finally said that he was resigning sharad pawar but did not resign but he handed over the party to his daughter supriya sule and to praful patel that was an indication to ajit pawar that finally when it comes to comes to a child a direct offspring and the nephew or a niece you know who gets the precedence so that tells you something about family politics as well so i will give you two more quotes from the same autobiography of sharad pawar one he says because the question now is what will sharad pawar do now sharad pawar always confuses everybody friends and foe so 2009 elections when ncp and the congress were fighting together ups second election he made some statement in odisha in fact i mentioned it before i think more than once 
in episodes concerning Maharashtra politics in Sharad Pawar. He made some statement that was a bit like, we'll decide who to go with or which coalition after the election. So I had asked Pranam Mukherjee then in a Walk the Talk episode recorded while the campaigning for 2009 elections were on. I asked him, look, why is Sharad Pawar giving these mixed signals? And he said, ha, ah, Sharad Pawar always gives mixed signals. So to me, that line defines Sharad Pawar. That's the reason I've quoted it a couple of times earlier also. Now today, what mixed signals will he give? So I will quote for you something that he's written in his autobiography. He says, and I quote, in politics, one should be careful of not letting the competition know your future strategies. And I have that knack, right? He's pleading guilty. I have that knack. I have that knack. When your side is weak, the competition should know what will you do next and they remain confused. That is when you can be four steps ahead of them. So if you follow that principle, you can make your guesses as to what will Sharad Pawar do next. Then he also goes on to say, our family has a very good tradition. One can be anywhere in the world, but during Diwali, for those four or five days, everyone should assemble at our home. Now, if you read these two passages from his autobiography together, you can have a nice little betting game in your family, on your family dining table or among your friends or in your office to figure out whether this Diwali get together will take place in the Pawar household this year or not. And if it does take place, who all will be there, whether all the family members will be there. And if so, will they be in different political parties or will they be probably in the same political party? So those are the uncertainties that Pawar politics by its very definition causes. So I've been thinking of something to round off this episode of Cut the Clutter with. So what is it that this episode in national politics tell us? What this tells us is, how much, how much our politics is like a shark tank, a shark tank. So then read up on the sharks. So I actually started reading up on the sharks. You can do so also. So when you Google sharks, you might get to a website called seaworld.org and it will tell you some characteristics of the sharks. And I will just read one sentence from there. Many sharks prey most often on the weak, inferior members of the population. They select the weak, ill, injured or the dying prey because it is easier to catch. This is their own population. So politics, what is politics but but a shark tank? I know shark tank is a very, very, I know shark tank is a very popular expression these days because of something that's going on in your TV screens. So what is the lesson? The lesson is politics is a brutal take no, no prisoners game in which bhai, ban, cousin, nephew, niece, it doesn't matter. So ultimately you act in your best interest and everybody who is weak, who looks like he or she is losing, then becomes a victim or that becomes an easy prey. So it's not that different from what you see in Shark Tank, the TV show. Even more importantly, it's very similar to what happens to real life sharks, the marine sharks.